Yeah. Up to them to do the work. And I have to remind myself sometimes that I have a larger impact on them than I realize that I have on them. So as I listen to some of the other um, professional developments that we've had last, well, over the last, I guess, two weeks ago, I don't know. It's been interesting. Um, but I heard some other people resonating the same things I've been thinking and feeling about my own class where our students want to show up and impress us. Our students don't want us to be disappointed in them. And, you know, that's something for a long time in my teaching career I didn't really consider. I didn't think about how they also, it wasn't about their mom or dad. It wasn't about their kids sometimes. It's about their desire to impress us. And they don't want to, um, I think someone said, they don't want to perform poorly on a test for me. And, and that's so true. Like that resonates significantly with me. So some of the things I have found in my own classroom and ways that I have been able to impact my students in a positive way was through letting them know that it's okay to be human. Like it's okay to have a breakdown in my office. It's okay to um, put your life before your class. And that's been a really big piece I have found over and over and over again with a lot of my students is they think that my expectation of them is that my class comes before everything else in their life. And that's not really the case, or I don't think it personally should be. I mean, some people may disagree, but I think that it's really important that our students know that they have a life, they have a significant other, they have children, they have jobs, they have you know, parents to take care of or animals or whatever those other obligations are that they have, just because they came to college didn't mean that those things went away. And helping them understand that prioritizing things and letting school be second sometimes is is okay. Like you don't want it to negatively impact your grades, but there are decisions that have to be made. And so I think one of the biggest things that I've done to impact my students in a positive way was humanizing myself. Because my students believe that I'm up here somewhere really high on some pedestal and that I have no faults or I have, you know, I can do no wrong or they're scared to tell me I've made a mistake. Um, I had a student already this semester. I've already made my first mistake. Congratulations to me. And <laughs> I posted recordings of lectures for my students. I started making some recordings of lectures because I realized my very first Zoom, I had about half the class, only about half the class. And I was like, mm, well, there's, we know there's a D2L glitch. We know that these other things are happening. Some people don't have good internet. I live in a very remote kind of, I won't say remote. I don't live in a remote, but a lot of my students live in remote areas around me. And so they may not even have the capability to get on Zoom. So I started recording the lectures. Well, I record, I posted one of the links twice. Mm -hmm. So I broke my lecture down into mini lectures. And one of them I had labeled correctly, but I posted the wrong link. And one of my students has already reached out and said, hey, um, I tried this multiple times before contacting you. I, I don't think it's the right link. Uh, if I'm doing something wrong, please let me know. And I was like, girl. You are perfectly fine. Thank you so much for telling me. I am human, right? I make mistakes too. And they emailed back and I know it's their email and it's hard to get a feel for the way someone is like speaking, what their body language would be or from an email. But she responded back and she was like, oh, thank you so much. I thought I was doing something wrong and I was worried to email you. And I was like, please never be afraid to tell me I've done something wrong. <laughs> like I am human. And so I think that has made a huge impact, like in a positive way on my students, because they now feel like they can approach me. They now feel like they can come to me and say, I am not ready for this test, or I am not, um, I haven't been able to study, or I don't know how to study for this test, or, you know, any of those things. So I think it's been really impactful just to simply humanize myself. I mean, there are a lot of things I do in D2L. Excuse me. I, um, you know, I've started putting recordings out there. 
Um, I've started putting the very controversial topic in STEM of study guides out for my students. Um, you know, I've started building more material for them, but that just means there's more stuff they have to wade through and decide between is this required or not required. So I really think one of the biggest impacts I've had is just simply letting them understand that I don't think I'm better than them. Um, I let them call me Rachel. I mean, some of them will never call me Rachel. Um, they just, it goes against everything in their soul. Some of them call me Miss Lewis. Some of them, I have nicknames they've given me, Miss Lou, um, you know, all kinds of things. But just being on a more personable level with them, I think has made a really big impact on them. Kristen, hi. <laughs> You're probably in the same boat I was this morning. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> That's okay, I was too. <laughs> So what is something that you found that really has impacted your students in a positive way? So when we first started talking about doing this, this little meeting thing, you and I, personally, we talked about doing um, Kahoot quizzes in class um, just to kind of make it feel like a game make it feel like a competition. I don't know about you guys. My students are extremely competitive. Like they might not be competing if they had a paper quiz in front of them to see who gets the best score on the quiz. But if they're racing to get the answer before the person next to them, then they are way more into it. And so that was something that you and I had talked about doing. Um, it works in most of my classes. I do have a class in McEwen High School. And McEwen is very rural for those of you guys who don't know where that is. Um, there's not even a red light in McEwen. Um, so we have internet if the weather's nice, like that's about like the best way that I can say it. Um, if it rains, if it snows like this, um, we don't have internet there. And I actually saw somebody do on one of the AQ videos, they basically were doing TikTok, or not TikTok, they were doing Kahoot quizzes, but like, I don't know, with cards, like, their students would have a blue card if the answer is uh, A and a yellow card if the answer is B and physically hold them up. So that's something I'm going to try this semester because, well, I never know when I'm going to have technology. And I know I'm supposed to be doing the opposite of that, like amping the amount of technology I use in my classrooms and not going backwards. But I'm thinking about going backwards for that class because I just never know when it's going to work. Um, but when I started doing Kahoot quizzes in my class, it was probably, oh goodness, six years ago. Um, and I read all the questions out loud when I have them up on the board. And so that solves the problem of my students who need readers. And I find that I, I have a lot of those. Um, I don't know if that's just out where I am um, or if you guys see that in Nashville as well but I feel like I get a lot of things from the Access Center saying that my students need someone to read their quizzes to them. Um, and so I read my quiz to the whole class then when I do it on the board. Um, and I feel like that has helped a lot. That has helped tremendously with my students, especially low performing students or students who weren't doing well on a traditional paper quiz will then do really well on a Kahoot quiz. Even if it's the same questions, even if it's the same style, like multiple choice, just having it in a game kind of setting and having them compete and reading it out loud, I think has helped my students a whole lot. That reminded me when you said that, um, one of the things that I did in my class that did not work, because we're here to talk about both, right? Like there are things that we do that don't work. Um, I teach science, micro and A&P are primarily the courses I teach. 
And um, I think a lot of the students I have are like me. They don't like to work in groups. <laughs> and that's kind of a requirement in science is that we work in groups of four. Um, some of that is due to we have six models. So I'm busting a class of 24 into four groups and you don't have a choice because I don't have 24 models, you know. Um, but I tried in an effort um, to get my students to build more community in my classroom, having them switch seats every two weeks. That did not go as planned. <laughs> that did not go well at all, right? Um, I had gotten the idea from someone else who it did work in their classroom. I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. And it was an epic fail for my class. Um, they, I find that for my classrooms, they build like miniature little families in my class. So the group of people that they start working with at the beginning, they are going to die by those peers side at the end of the semester with them. Like they are all in, but trying to get the whole room to be like one big collaborative, you know, family unit. Not so much, but they do make smaller groups within themselves. So I quit immediately, like after that, sem I gave it a whole semester of giving it a shot. We, we did try the good, good, you know, effort, but it didn't go well. And so then I was like, um, well, let's not do that again. Let's go back to just letting them work in their normal groups of four. And so I will periodically give them an assignment, uh, something that I've just created where I will get them to work in like larger groups. So they still have to interact with each other, but just they still have their comfort zone. They still have their safety blanket of the person in their group that they feel comfortable with interacting with. Um, and so that has tended to work better. I also find that, again, I teach science. So more hands-on activities I can give them the better they do in my course. Um, one of the big topics for biology is transcription translation. It's how cells make proteins. And it's a reoccurring theme in almost all of our biology classes. Uh, to some degrees, it's, you know, more in depth than others, but that's something we've really struggled to teach for a long time. I mean, the information's there. It's just not clicking because it's something they can't see. And so I found an open source resource that's really geared to K through 12 teachers, but there's nothing that says I can't use it in my classroom to where we, we, we pretend to be kindergarten for a day and we, I cut out or I print off all the papers in different colors. So we're doing DNA. So A's, T's, C's, and G's. And we basically cut and paste together our DNA strand. And then we cut and paste the RNA going across it. And we do all the things literally on paper, like, you know, we're doing crafts and it's time consuming, but that has been a significant help for my students in understanding the concept simply because it was something they could then touch. This is not something they can normally touch. It happens inside of like our nucleus of our cell, you know, and then right outside of it at ribosomes. And so being able to bring that to life for them has been a huge success. Something I started working on uh, last semester for microbiology was bringing to life the cell wall of bacteria. And you would be surprised how few models there are out there. I mean, this is like a really big topic we spend a lot of time on in microbiology. Like you got to understand it to move forward, especially in any career related to that. There are very, very, very few models out there. So I'm uh, looking into a 3D printer, but obviously not some big fancy one, but maybe I could build my own because being able to touch that, being able to manipulate that, I think would be a huge success for my students. So I find that a lot of my students are hands-on learners. Um, I have not done the Kahoot quizzes. I've talked about it for years. I just have not been able to find the time to invest into making them. And Kristen makes it look so easy. I've seen her cahoots. She makes it look so easy. Um, but that's still something in, in my future to-do list that I have. 
I also, like Rachel, find that my students are mostly kinesthetic learners. I don't know if that's because of the campus that we're on or if that's the same for all of you guys. It's the same for all of you guys. For me, it's a little harder because she gets to teach science, which is more kinesthetic. But I teach English, um, which is, you know, read-write. And my students are not read-write learners, but it helps. I am not a read-write learner. I am a kinesthetic learner. And... They have long joked with me on my campus that I picked the wrong career, um, that I picked the wrong discipline to go into because I will bring into my classroom scissors and paste and make my students reorder their papers physically rather than cutting and pasting in Microsoft Word. We're cutting and pasting in real life um, when they have things that need to move in the order of their papers. Um, I also have many, many, many colors of Expo markers and like to assign a different one to each student. And instead of writing down what they're thinking about the story we're talking about in literature in their paper or on their paper in front of them, they're writing it down on my board, on my whiteboard. And our previous dean in English called my class uh, chaotic but I think in a nice way, an organized chaos, because when you have 20 students in a literature class and all of them are having to fight each other for board space, it gets a little chaotic, but they do all have to write their opinion on the thesis or the uh, textual evidence that we are looking for up on the board instead of on their paper. But I, I mean, that also makes me make them physically take notes because, well, that improves your retention, right? Physically writing it scientifically makes you more likely to remember something. And we tell students that, and we tell students to write it on their paper. But if I, I don't go around and check, like, are you taking notes today? Um, that would be a lot, but I can make sure they're writing it up on the board because they each get their own color expo marker. Um, and scissors and paste. I've had people come in and be like, are you really making that kid cut apart their paper? Yes. Yes, I am. I am. Some of them get really upset about it too. Um, and I've learned to, to the ones that are about to get really upset, like I've learned to identify that. I can tell that they're, oh, they do not want to take a pair of scissors to this thing that they've worked so hard on because they think that means something bad. Right. Um, and so I'll just look at, go make a photocopy of it and then, okay, cut apart the photocopy. Then they cut that copy apart. And when they see it reordered, then they realize, oh, you're right it is better like this, or you're right, this didn't belong in that paragraph, it belonged in this paragraph. Um, and then they're not as as reluctant to do it, but I have had a lot of uh, hesitancy to cutting apart papers. Something else I've done, and hopefully my communication um, peers will, will love this one. In microbiology, um, for years, we've required a presentation and we had the option to do away with it. Uh, it's not necessarily something we have to do in the class, but it's something I've kept. And in fact, I went from doing one presentation to two presentations during the semester. One is about the halfway mark. It's on a virus. Um, I give them a list to choose from. They get to pick. It's wonderful. Then at the end is uh, something on bacteria. And at first, I was really hesitant. Um, I considered getting rid of the presentation. And then I was like, no, by the end of it, you know, the class has become this unit and they're very supportive of each other and they will prep each other with questions to ask them so that because they don't want me to ask a question. <laughs> they don't want my questions and I don't ask hard questions, but they're terrified that I'm going to ask them something they don't know the answer to. And so I actually increased it to two presentations and I've had huge success with that. Now I do give them an option. Um, I have students that are like, I'm totally going to drop your class. And I'm like, I mean, that's fine. If you drop my class, you still have to take micro somewhere, but I do give them the option. They can present it in person, which I would say 99% of my students present in person. And um, it's like a three to five minute speech. Like, presentation. And then I give them the option if they are absolutely terrified, they think they're going to throw up or pass out at the front of the classroom, like 
just cannot do it. They can record their presentation. They still have to show it in class. They still have to be present for their questions to be able to answer anything. They still have to provide a handout to their peers. I have them create PowerPoint presentations. And then all the students are tested over those presentations at a later exam because it's all material they would have to know anyways. I'm just letting the students present it from a student perspective. Um, and at the end of the semester, I always get positive feedback from having them do presentations. And I know they're terrified of it, but they end up loving it by the end. Their second presentation is always a million times better than their first presentation. I think that has to do with nerves, you know, that they were just really nervous the first go around. But by the, the end, even those that have recorded the first one usually don't record the second one. They actually give it live in class. And so I, I've started incorporating that. And I think it's had a really positive impact on my students. And you see them kind of like rally around each other. You can hear them in the hallways having conversations about like, okay, I'll ask you this. If you get nervous, just look at me. Like, you're going to be fine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love it so much <laughs> that they're doing that. Um, something else that I do, and I think some other do this as well. There's a thing called VARK, V-A-R-K. And you can go online. If it's okay, I'm going to share my screen in a second. I'll pull it up. And VARK is a free online tool that you can use. I just simply um, Google the word VARK and it comes up. It's wonderful. Now, there are some ads. This actually started as someone's dissertation. It was a project and then they've ended up keeping it up and maintaining it and making it better over the years. But this is something that I have started doing with my students. Here we go. Of course, there's always an ad. Um, but it's a VART questionnaire and it's based around how your brain takes in information. So, Kristen actually reminded me of this when she said, um, you know, some people are more kinesthetic. So this addresses visual learners, auditory learners, um, kinesthetic learners, and reader writer learners, which I am a thousand percent over a reader writer. And if I don't write it, if I don't read it and then write it in my own words, it probably does not exist in my brain. So the way it works is the student reads through these and it'll give them different questions in different order of questions if they do it more than once. And you simply go down through here and you click on the option that your gut, you know, says this, this is my option, right? Like I want to learn how to play a new board game or card game. I would do which of the following and you can pick more than one answer. I would use the diagrams that explain the various stages, moves and strategies in the game. I would read the instructions. That's 100 percent me. Watch other players play before joining the game. Listen to somebody explain it. So you would pick, you know, what sounds good to you. And then you would go down and there's about 20 questions. And so I'm just going to kind of like randomly click so I can show you the next page. But. I use this with my students and I've done this a couple of different ways. Some semesters I have um, required them to do it and I've created a D2L quiz where they tell me what their uh, scores are at the end and then they have to um, tell me how they what they learned from this exercise, how they think they'll study moving forward. So on the second page, it just gives you your results. And so, of course, I just randomly selected. So my scores are pretty even across the board. But it says I'm a multimodal learner. It does give you the option to purchase. I always tell my students, do not purchase the full report. That is not a requirement. This is a free item. But it will give you the links that apply to you. So you can click on one of the links and you can read about how your brain prefers to take in information. How you tend to present information to others, which was a real eye opener, I think, for a lot of students, because they're like, oh, I do that when I give directions to people on how to go somewhere. And then it will talk about in education, here are things that would help you. In the workplace, here are things that would help you, because there are now companies that use this 
um, as a tool in the workspace. So I talked to them about these are great ways, you know, to work through something. I find that my students who are multimodal learners um, struggle the most, honestly. You would think a multimodal learner would no longer have any issues whatsoever. Um, like they would just, they just absorb the information in all the ways. Not necessarily true. They have to figure out for each topic, like in history, they might, their brain might absorb information better in a different way than it would in a science classroom, right? Or maybe in science, this topic, they can just listen to you talk and they're just absorbing it. But another topic is something they can't like see in their brain. So they have to turn it into a kinesthetic activity because their brain really wants all the modalities. So I have a lot of conversation with students, especially when they come to me and say, I don't know how to study for your class. I thought I studied. I used my flashcards because they all get told to use flashcards in high school. And they come in and their first test and they're like, I failed. And I don't know what I did wrong. And I thought I knew the information. So we talk a lot about, I have them do the VARC in my, in my office usually. Um, I have it linked out in my D2L shell, but you know, this is an optional item. They ignore those half the time. So I'm like, reminder, it's there if you ever need it again. Um, but we do that and we discuss those options. And obviously I'm not an auditory learner. So, you know, when they say, well, how would you study? I say things like, I can show you some of my notebooks. I still have them from grad school. That may not be how your brain processes information though, right? Like my study process is very lengthy. And when I tell them about it, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, you read the book, you go to class, you take the notes, you read the book again, and then you write it all in different colors in your own handwriting. And it's very time consuming, but that's not what works for everyone. So I spend a lot of time with them trying to basically teach them how to study because they don't know, at least not, you know, in Humphreys County and Dixon County. And they, I think that's really everywhere, though. They just they haven't been taught how to study to take a test. They've been taught how to memorize information and regurgitate it, but not how to apply it and not how to study independently of being told these are the 12 facts that will be on your test. Right. So. I find that I'm teaching them how to study and then something else building off that, that I did as a result of these conversations, I started making test banks back in COVID when we all went online and I had to move all my exams to online. And so I created a test bank for each exam. And then I just started adding more and more and more questions to them over the years. And I've turned that into practice questions. They can take practice question quizzes that are 10 questions each. They have zero points in the course. So this is solely to help them if they feel that that's something they need. But I find that after the first test, the usage of those practice quizzes goes up significantly. Like that skyrockets because they're like, oh, I can practice taking her test. And of course, their test is not the same questions, but I wrote all of them. So it's in the language I'm using in class because I don't use publisher provided questions. Um, I'm writing the questions myself and they get to practice the material because one thing that I find my students are doing when we're having conversations about studying is they're just rereading their notes. Well, of course, you think you know the information if you've read the page 15 times. You basically have it memorized and the visual cue is this little header you've made that, oh, well, this comes next. But that visual cue is no longer on my exam when you sit down to take the test and now you can't remember it because you don't have that visual link anymore. So we talk a lot about practicing exams. Um, we also use a platform called Connect that has um, publisher created test banks. And so the very first time I ever did this, I did not want them to have my own personal questions. So I just used that. And even then, I think the students still benefited from it. It's just I may give different wordage, verbiage. Um, I break things down when, when I talk more than a textbook does. So I finally just started using my own as 
their practice. And that seems to help a lot because they don't know how to take a test. Like at all. <laughs> it's really fun to be in this presentation with you, Rachel, and to hear things that we do that are the same. I have a practice test for my test or for my final exam in comp one. It's not worth any points. They can take it as many times as they want to. And it's just similar questions as to what will be on the exam that shows them what the exam is going to be like. And I don't know about yours, but mine seem to have like the test anxiety that that gets rid of because they're like, oh, I know what the test is going to be like now um, because I've done the practice test. And the ones who don't do it, I think I see a big, a big difference between them. And then also it's fun that you do VARC in your classes. I obviously, I do VARC in my classes as well. I want to know what my students are doing. And it's been extremely eye-opening for me in comp one, um, because in comp one, I have a large percentage of IPCT majors. Um, I don't know if you ever get IPCT students. Okay. They are so visual. Like I might think some of their reading skills are weak, but they could like look at a blueprint and build something like that, which to me, it makes zero sense. I'm like, how, how did you do that? Because I'm like zero visual. And so it has been very eye opening for me both in, you said the VARC shows you how you take in information, but also how you present information. And I realized I was not presenting information in a way that makes sense to these kids because they're visual and I'm zero visual, zero. Um, I only have those students in comp one. That's the only English class the IPCT major requires. Um, but I am looking to how for well, I don't have comp one this semester, but for the next time I have comp one, whenever that is, how do I make it more visual? How do I incorporate that into my class? Because that, that VARC survey, like you said, it's, it's, it's really eye opening. 100% agree. Cause I realized that I was presenting things in very much like a written format. I mean, I obviously have lecture, but I had a lot of just written format resources for them. And that's because that's how my brain processes information and I am not the auditory person. So I've had to remind myself when I am creating recorded lectures that I need to break it down into small pieces instead of having an hour and a half long recorded lecture that they do not watch. They may get through the first 30 minutes and then they bail um, to do it in smaller portions and to make sure that I'm being very repetitive in the way I present the information to them, because that seems to be very beneficial in auditory learning is the repetitive nature of hearing it more than once. And so, of course, I just read it more than once. So why would I need to say it more than once? But of course, I'm looking at it from the reader writer perspective and not from an auditory standpoint. So that's taken me a lot of work to improve my own lectures over the years. I find that if I look back, to 10 or 12 years ago, I could go through an entire PowerPoint presentation that had 60, 75 slides in an hour, no big deal. Like we have extra time in class to do lab stuff. And now I can get through 30 slides on a good day, on a good day. But it's because of the way I'm breaking it down and talking about it more and repetitive and asking them questions more. I used to never ask questions in class. I know that sounds terrible as an educator, but I didn't. There was no class on how to teach. You know, you just fall into it in grad school and then you fall in love with it and you just keep going. And so I had to remind myself, oh, I need to pause. I need to pause here and ask questions and wait for a response. I used to be the world's worst at being like, okay, moving on. <laughs> five seconds later after I hadn't received an answer from them. And so just waiting for them, giving them that uncomfortable silence has made a huge difference in their engagement in my classroom. Even on Zoom yesterday, it's my AMP2 students. They had me for AMP1. I think I have one student that didn't have me for AMP1. And we're talking and I'm asking about blood and we're going over it and I'm drawing on my tablet to show them how we do this. And I just wait, ask a question. I just waited. 
Finally, one of them spoke up and I could hear him chuckling when he answered the question because he knew what I was doing. He knew I was, I was just going to wait. I can outweigh you. That's fine. Somebody's going to give me an answer. It's okay if it's wrong. I tell him all the time, it's okay to be wrong. Like we're wrong a lot in science, actually. Like of the majors, we're probably the most wrong ever. (laughs) We have to get it wrong a million times before we get it right. So it's okay to be wrong. And so uh, that's always fun because I've, I can see my own like evolution of teaching and engagement with students over the years. And um, a cue also made a huge difference for me. Do If you have not done a cue, um, I was very hesitant when I did it. I was not on board at first. I got convinced to do it. I absolutely loved it. I took a lot of things away from it. And I've slowly been going back through the course and like printing things off. I was like, mm, I'm going to need that later too. I want to print this off like because we have all the resources for it still for like a year. So I'm still like pulling things and going, oh, yeah, I want to do that. I forgot that I wanted to do that because it's a lot of information. You can't implement everything right away. It takes time. So I've been going back and pulling things. And uh, so just a little plug, if you haven't considered it, you should. It's awesome. I just want to like second that because I have said multiple times that I wish I'd had the AQ course like 12 years ago. It would have been great. Um, Instead of, you know, like in grad school, they just throw you into a classroom and see if you like it. Right. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I think I know more what I'm doing now, but um, yeah, it's, it's helped. I think, I think it's helped, even though I have already been teaching this long. um, I think, I was also hesitant to do it too. And then I got really hesitant. I think the first lesson is something like learning your students' names. And I'm like, I've been doing that. Um, But it gets, you know, more in depth. And it is things that I wish somebody had told me, you know, 12 years ago when I first started teaching. But even now, I think it's really helpful. Yeah, I, um, I try really hard to learn my students' names. Names are not my strong suit. I always ask my students, is there a name you want me to call you? Do you have a nickname? I have some students that use names that make no connection to their birth name, you know, their given name. Um, And so I have to make myself notes. And I told my students, they don't know this yet. Um, But I warned those that I had at the end of last semester. I said, just so you know, like the first two weeks of school, you're going to come into my class. You're going to sign in like normal. And then you're going to put a name tag on. And I'm going to wear one too. We're all going to wear name tags because I am terrible at your name and I need to be able to visualize your name with your face, especially later when you call me panicking over something. And so um, I'm I'm actually going to make them wear name tags this year for two weeks so I can make sure I get them all down pat because there's always a few that I struggle with the most till the end of the semester. So I was like, just just be warned, guys, there will be name tags this year. There will be name tags. Does anybody have anything they want to share that's really worked for you? We've done a lot of talking. You've done a lot of amazing talking, Rachel and Kristen, and we appreciate you so much. I will say something that I started a few semesters ago Mm -hmm. in my classes is in the survey. I asked them face-to-face, we do Slido. If not, we do it in a survey in D2L ask my students what their goals are for the semester. And then the next question that I ask is, how can I help you reach your goals? And that is such a good way of building belonging and engagement. And especially face-to-face virtual, we can have that conversation about it. When it's online, I'm able to go back to the new section because it's anonymous and say, here are some things people said that I could do to help. And here is how I'm doing it. And most of it is already there. They just haven't clicked on it yet. But it's allowed me to be able to really build that connection of, I hear your goals. I'm listening to them. Now let's help us get there. I just thought of something else I wanted to mention. Um, I made a little list, but I don't always do good following my list. So 
Um, something else that I've really started doing with my students, and it's been really time consuming and it creates a little chaos in my class. So my type A personalities don't necessarily love this about my class, but um, I present them with a schedule at the beginning of the semester. And there's a big fat heading on it that says subject to change, estimated course schedule only. Because I'm not opposed to letting them vote at the beginning of the semester. Do you want to take a test every two chapters, every three chapters, or every four chapters? And I even went so far over the summer for my summer course to mock it up and give you, this is what it would look like if you do this option. This is what it looks like if you do this option. And this is what it looks like if you do this option. And I let the class vote on what they want the course to look like. Um, I've let them vote before on, do you want required homework assignments? It's a buffer on your grade. It's 10%. Or do you just want me to throw that 10% in with your exams and just don't have homework? Um, so I've kind of changed, you know, what options I give them as I've moved through this process since about a year ago of letting them take more ownership of the course and letting dis decisions happen where they really have say and power in their course. You know, um, there are some things we can't avoid. They can't, you know, change the quantity of material that we cover. You can't delete content. You can't say, oh, well, we want to push the test out a week. Okay, I've done that. I let them do that. But that means that we have to move quicker through other material or it's you're going to have like cram session at the end of the semester and you're going to have two tests back to back and nobody wants that. You know, so we have those realistic conversations. Um, and the most recent thing I did was completely because of a cue. I decided to let my students have the option to retake all of their lecture exams. Lab exams, they don't get the option to retake. That's too complicated because of lab space and setting up models and all the things. It takes hours to build one. But I have given them the option since doing a queue. And I started that first semester. At mid semester, I was like, hey guys, guess what? We're doing something different. I I'm going to give you this option. And they all have the option to retake all of their lecture exams one time. My first semester, I let them do it as many times as they wanted. That was horrific. That was terrible. I will never do that again. <laughs> but I do give them the chance to retake each one of their lecture exams. Or they can make it up. So I found that students weren't coming on test day when I gave them this option. Because they were like, oh, I'll just take it later. And then I can do my retake later. So I've made the rule that you can retake it if you take it on the day assigned in class or you can make it up. So maybe you have the flu, maybe your dog died, you know, maybe you just don't feel good and you didn't get out of bed on time. I don't know, but you either get a retake or a makeup and you get to choose. And then we just schedule that in my office at some point. So um, that's been a game changer. I have seen grades improve. You really see it from those that are really invested. I think those are the ones that it helps the most. I have students that retake every exam and they do basically the same, if not worse, when they retake. But it's the level of effort, right? You can really see the difference in those that are like, okay, I miss these things. And they'll come to me and say, can you explain this to me? I don't understand it. Like I thought I understood it, but I don't understand it. So that's been really helpful also for my students. It's been a big game changer. And they think I'm amazing because of it. So if you just want like, you know, student support and love, 10 out of 10 recommend. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, let me unmute. So I have a question. So based on what you teach, I'm assuming that you have a lot of pre-nursing students. Um, have, all of them. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um have you heard any feedback from how being able to retake tests in your class has impacted their time in the nursing program with that expectation? I'm just curious. No, that's a great question. And I actually, I'll, I'll call one of my, one of my best friends actually works in our nursing department. So I'll give her a buzz later today now. And I'll be like, Hey, I have a question, Molly. Um, I have not. I have stayed in touch with several of my students. So I have a couple of students in our nursing program currently, and I have some that are at Columbia. So I may even just reach out to them and be like, hey, how do you think this has helped you? 
Um, I also find that the students I do know that are in our nursing program and in Columbia State's program right now, they were my higher end students, my students that didn't necessarily need to retake any of the exams. One of them retook all of the exams because she got a B the first time or a 90. Of course. And I said, <laughs> you got an A. And she was like, but I could do better. And I was like, okay, you can, I mean, there is, there's no, there's no minimum to retake it. That's fine. <laughs> but so, uh, but yeah, I'll, that's a good question. I'll ask. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I, I was just curious. Get that luxury. They do not get that luxury. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. I have to say thank. You. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sally. Okay. I just I've been putting some a few things in the chat about mm -hmm. Merlot. Apparently, I'm the queen and promoter of Merlot. But I don't know if any of you guys. I saw someone responded. They use it. They've been using some resources. Um. Have any of you investigated the content builder part of Merlot, which I think could be beneficial in engaging students, possibly? I don't teach. I'm a librarian, so I don't teach directly. I put a link to something I created using content builder, a story walk, talking about databases and all. I'd love to know your opinion of that. But you can get students maybe to join Merlot, and then they can collaborate among themselves. Could you talk about group learning and sciences? They can go into Merlot, become members as students, and then collaborate in groups online. I don't know if it'd be beneficial or not, but I would love to <laughs> just throw that out there because you can collaborate using Merlot as long as each person is in Merlot, but it's free. And it's something they can then take with them. Am I unmuted? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, I'm just making sure that. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, yeah, so I just thought you might want to investigate the content builder part of Merlot, which you cannot see unless you actually join Merlot, which again, is free. So I thought it might have some benefit for student small groups, possibly. I don't know. I'm like I say, I'm not a teacher. I teach databases <laughs> and Merlot. <laughs> and Merlot is like Google for education, as I call it. But yeah, whatever you want to call it. But I think it's good stuff. So it's basically an OER finder. So anyway, that's all I was going to say. Yeah, I would love to know your opinion and uh, whatever <laughs> or not. Thank you. I, I've uh, actually clicked on it to be able to go look at it when we're done. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. I want to say thank you so much to Rachel and Kristen for presenting today and for leading this panel. Excellent job to both of you. We appreciate you greatly.